All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, presentation of student research from space physics astronomy. Uh, this uh, planetarium is your uh, place to, to view this information. And Dr. Noel Richardson, you're seeing him out front, will be introducing all the presenters. They have some uh, incredible things they've been working on, and I hope you're curious about the, those uh, uh, topics of research. If you have any questions for them, please put them in the YouTube live chat and we will be uh, able to answer some of those questions at the end of the program. But now, without further ado, here's Dr. Noel Richardson. Well, thank you very much, Eric. Thank you to the Planetarium for hosting this today. We are very happy that despite all the um, challenges that our students have faced over the last year and a bit, that we have some very fine seniors that are about to graduate from our space physics program. <clears throat> And so to celebrate that today, we have uh, them giving us a talk about the work that they did on their capstone research projects here at Embry-Riddle. And so first up today is Miss Ashley Elliott. Ashley has been working with me on her senior capstone this year. Uh, she is going to be attending the Louisiana State University to pursue a PhD in astrophysics in the fall. And today she will be talking about five years of bright photometry of the luminous blue variable P. Cygni. So thank you, Ashley. Take it away. All right, we are wor okay. We're working. All right. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Richardson. Um, and yeah, he already kind of went over what I'm going to be talking about today. But um, we will go ahead and get started. All right. So before. I get into the nitty gritty of what I did over the last year. I should probably tell you what a luminous blue variable star is um, because it is pretty relevant to, uh, well, the star P Cygni. So a luminous blue variable star is a massive post main sequence star. It is uh, the main characteristic of a luminous blue variable is their a geyser like behavior, which basically means um, it is uh, there's a dramatic increase in brightness and then it slowly decreases over time and also during these dramatic increases in brightness there's also a mass ejection um, which is why we call them eruptions so it also has mass ejection light brightness it's pretty cool to see of course we haven't really seen one in my lifetime i haven't seen one in my lifetime but i think it'd be pretty cool to see and also a luminous blue variable star also has what's called a Estoratus phase or phases. And so what these phases are is they are the time periods without an eruption and they do exhibit brightness variability, which also means that the star is appearing dimmer in the optical, but also appears hotter in the temperature in its temperature. So um, we have some examples of some cool luminous blue variable stars. So over here we have uh, AG Carina, we have HD 168625 in the middle here, and then we also have Ada Carina, which is the topic of many of Dr. Richardson's other students. Um, so, of course, I had to put that in there. Um, so, here's some really pretty pictures of other luminous blue variable stars. So, some brief history on P. Cygni. So, its first eruption was discovered in August of 1600 by Willem Blau. The second eruption was seen in 1654, and since then, it has been the main focus of many observational studies to determine its photometric and spectroscopic properties. And here you can see in the historic light curve um, the two main eruptions. So for those that are live in the audience, this big bump, the first big bump that you see is that first eruption, and the second bump that you can see is that second eruption. And so pretty cool to see. And now on to what I've actually done over the last year. So over the last year, I have reduced about five years of bright data. And the bright satellite is, uh, stands for Bright Star Target Explorer. And it is a uh, combination of about eight or nine satellites. Um, and it uh, basically just observes all the sky and it's pretty cool. And so I took that data and I have uh, the years 2014, 15, 16, 18 and 19 and reduce that down to be usable. And then I also use the AAVSO, which stands for the American Association of Variable Star Observers, and use that data to scale the data down also to be usable, more understandable, and you can see what this looks like in my next slide. 
And once the data was now usable and makes more sense to perform more analysis on it, I used a program called Period 04 to perform Fourier analysis on each year and also all of the years together. And from this Period 04 and from the Fourier analysis, uh, I was able to get frequencies and out of these uh, light curves. And so from these frequencies, we needed to determine the feasibility of them. And so we wanted to make sure that, oh yeah, okay, this is a real frequency, this is not a real frequency, this one, yeah, probably not. And so I did that as well, and then from these known frequency, uh, we also compared com uh, known frequencies to the frequencies that I came up with from period 04, and determined if there was a presence of any possible period, which is important because there really hasn't been too much of a significant periods for P-Signy, it's been the topic of discussion since, well, the star has been discovered. So uh, we really wanted to see if we could see anything significant in the data. And then, of course, I'm also in the process of writing a paper, which is to be submitted this summer with hopes of being published soon. So, woo. All right, so here on this plot, my lovely all years data. So we have 2014 right at the top, all the way down to 2019 at the bottom. And so this is my reduced and scaled down data. And so as you can see, it's a little wobbly, but it's, it's really pretty, very nice data. And uh, it does span from about May 1st to November 15th of each year. And so we have a pretty good chunk of data to work with for each year. And this was also taken from plenty of the, most of the bright satellites that we, our data that I used was from Toronto. Um, so. They uh, produce the nicest, cleanest data for these years, and so we decided to uh, use that to analyze. So this is when this is what I've spent pretty much this entire semester doing is producing these plots for each one of my years. And so over here on the left, one of the directions I don't, um, we have the frequency uh, Fourier analysis with each of the peaks, and so you can see that there's these arrows and so each one of those arrows indicates the strongest peaks which is the frequencies that we determined were feasible and so um, that blue line that you can see on the plot as well as the noise floor and so all of the other peaks that you see were determined either to be too close to the noise floor or just not uh, as significant as the other four and so the plot um, next to it has two sections. It has the data with the four frequency, uh, which produced uh, four different uh, fits, and each one corresponds to the arrows over here. And underneath it is the O minus C, which stands for observed minus calculated. And so um, from this plot, we can see that with the O minus C, there is still data that um, shows some stoch stochastic variability which means that there's some stuff that we still haven't figured out what's really going on. And our main results so far. So we did find a common frequency among the five years of data that indicates a double period of the period 17.3. That can be seen on the green line across the data. And also um, this plot does show the um, amplitudes, uh, that's the different sizes of the different amplitudes. So it does correspond to all those sizes. And we also further confirmed the 500-day time scale that has been determined previously. And so we're pretty excited about these results. And that concludes my presentation. All right. Uh, we will uh, transition to our next presentation. So stay tuned, audience. We will be right back.
All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, next up, we have Coulter Richardson. Uh, Coulter will be uh, continuing on in grad school next year at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And today he will be talking about tapering and analytic co continuations of supernovae with uh, of supernovae gravitational waves with memory. Thank you, Coulter. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. Um, so yes, as Dr. Richardson mentioned, uh, and no relation, by the way, uh, <laughs> I am studying the taperings and analytic continuations of supernova gravitational waves with what we call a memory feature associated with it. Uh, so me and my co-authors listed there, uh, noticed that in this gravitational wave data, we see supernova gravitational waves from simulations. We haven't actually made a detection yet, but we're hoping that relatively quickly within the next maybe hopefully uh, observation run, we should actually see some gravitational waves from these uh, massive events. However, uh, we do have simulations to work off of. So in preparation for uh, these events, we are taking these simulations and we are investigating them as we would an actual event. And when we started looking at these, we noticed that a lot of these simulations are cut short due to computational costs, due to uh, computer time, due to a bunch of different factors. And we wind up seeing that when we have these artificial uh, truncations in the data, we see large uh, errors in the high frequency, which is shown on that plot there. So the memory properties that we really discuss are what is memory, specifically what is the difference between what we call a linear memory and a nonlinear memory. Um, other low frequency emissions, because as I'll get into, this memory is a very low frequency emission. Um, the actual example test bed that we used. And then we discuss the uh, angular dependence, the tapering, and an extension that we propose to add to some of these waveforms. And then we discuss the signal to noise ratio for these signals for both current ground based detectors and hopefully future space based detectors. So, what is linear versus nonlinear memory? In short, uh, there's a lot of text there, but in short, uh, linear memory is just a permanent deformation of space time. That means that the star blew up in such a way that everything around it gets permanently stretched or uh, shortened in some way, shape, or form. Nonlinear memory is actually a correction to the relativistic um, approximations when they calculate these uh, gravitational waves or when we measure them. So the memory is going to peak, the linear memory is going to peak at about one hertz but we can see tails that survive to much lower or much higher frequencies uh, depending on the situation that it arises in. The next two low frequencies that we see are from the standing accretion shock instability or that SASI and the proto neutron star oscillations or what we call the G mode. So these low frequency emissions generally happen. Uh, we can predict them based off this fitting equation which was uh, found by some of my co-authors and we see that generally these frequencies are much, much higher than our gravitational wave memory. We see that the standing accretion shock instability has a minimum frequency of about 125 hertz, and the G mode has a, a minimum frequency of about 430 hertz, which is well above our give or take one hertz range. So the exact uh, simulation that we used is uh, this W152 simulation that was performed uh, by the Albert Einstein Institute for Gravitational Physics in Germany. And it represents a 15 solar mass star that is non-rotating. Um, we do see two different sections in the data. We see what we call phase one and phase two. Phase one is a fully three-dimensional simulation that actually includes a ray-by-ray -ray transport for neutrinos. However, in the second phase where the computation goes on for much longer, this uh, neutrino approximation winds up getting very, very computationally intensive and so it gets very, very computationally expensive. So we wind up looking at these different phases. Phase one, which includes both the actual explosion of the star and the explosion of the star due to neutrinos, and the phase two, which just focuses on the explosion of the star. So we see very angular, uh, a lot of angular variance in this explosion. We can see that depending on where we look at it from, we wind up having different amplitudes for this permanent deformation of space time. When we plot these using sky maps, we can actually see that the flow or the actual explosion, the material that's leaving the star is rather regular. However, for the neutrino and for the actual signal that we expect to find, it is not as regular and much harder to fit. However, 
we present three toy models, one of them being prolate or a, sugar, a cigar shaped explosion, one of them being oblate or a pancake shaped explosion, or spheroid, which is some combination of the two of them. And we find that, well, based off of the simulation, which is on the top row, and our models, which is on the bottom row, we can detail a lot of this angular variability quite well. We miss some of the finer structures, but we can accurately model this uh, permanent deformation of space time. We do this by using a least square method or finding the difference between our model and the simulation and then seeing, finding the absolute minimum for those parameters. So with these simulations being cut off due to the computational expense, we wind up inducing these really, really high frequency events. So we propose to add a tapering or a cosine that kind of just brings the signal down to zero. And as we can see in this plot, for our signal, we can accurately just slap on a cosine, and we see a lot of variability in the actual light curve, or the uh, frequency curves itself. And as you can see on the right-hand side of that plot, the amplitude goes down when we add these taperings. However, we bring the amplitude back up on the left-hand side. So in order to compensate for all of this, we actually propose an extension as well, specifically for the neutrino signal, because we wind up seeing that, well, phase two, it didn't include the neutrino signal. And combining all of these, we actually find that at current detectors, given a source at either one kiloparsec or 10 kiloparsecs, we're gonna be hard pressed to find a uh, supernova signal. But for future space-based detectors, our likelihood to actually make a detection goes up quite a lot. Um, so uh, we are currently working on this and submitting it to the LIGO internal review and hopefully the physical review D soon. Um, that is it, so thank you very much. All right, once again, we'll take a quick break while the next presenter sets up, and then we'll be right back. Our next presentation is a double header where these two students have been working with each other um, on a project with Dr. Smith. And we have Austin uh, Luttrell and Ryder Moreno. Austin is about to go off to grad school for aerospace engineering at uh, CU Boulder. And Ryder is going to pursue a career in ornithology, uh, starting with a uh, position at the Highland Center this summer. And so congratulations to them. And we look forward to hearing more about your project entitled Investigation of Low Power Electrothermal Thrusters. So take it away. All right, thank you, Dr. Richardson. Um, so like he mentioned, um, we'll be explaining our investigation of low power electrothermal thrusters. Um, so Ryder and I are actually part of a larger team um, called Project ET, um, studying various types of electric propulsion here on campus. Um, so I am a co-team lead, and Ryder is also a co-team lead, um, and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so this is a quick list of just our current team members, and we have several underclassmen um, on the team that will be taking over for us in the fall. Um, and Ryder is going to explain our project goals. Okay, so just going briefly over uh, the project goals for our semester and our year being seniors, uh, basically we wanted to design, build, and test a low-power electrothermal thruster, has been done by teams in the past, but we wanted to redesign it and get some better operating parameters. We wanted to complete construction and design of the thrust stand, uh, which again has been designed by previous years, but we would like to keep, keep it going and get that so that we can eventually then integrate both systems into the vacuum chamber in the space system lab and hopefully measure quantitatively some thrust outputs 
from our um, electrothermal uh, propulsion systems. All right, so you might be asking why electric propulsion. Um, so electric propulsion is a type of exotic propulsion um, that is very commonly used on satellites. Um, so what electric propulsion is, is it uses electricity to produce um, thrust. There are various types of it. Um, so when you implement this system onto a satellite, um, it produces very low levels of thrust. Um, so it's not very helpful for getting out of the atmosphere, but it is great for smaller maneuvers, such as repositioning of the satellites, orbit transfers, and it also has a great ISP, which stands for a specific impulse, which is essentially the space gas mileage for these kinds of air aerospacecraft. Um, so because it has a great ISP, um, there's also a ton of potential for deep space travel with these systems. Um, and so there's a lot of research going into this area currently. Um, so the current, the specific type of thruster that we're researching is an electrothermal thruster. So what that means is that it uses electricity to heat up and ionize different types of propellant um, to actually produce this thrust and make the system go. Yeah. So this is just a brief kind of picture of a very general arc jet design. This is not our specific arc jet. But I'm just going to kind of, I guess I should say, our type of electrothermal thruster is an arc jet. And so basically we start on the left here with electrical power in. We go and put a bunch of high voltage onto this tungsten cathode. Um, and then we flow nitrogen in to the, it'll kind of flow along the tungsten rod. And then eventually we have this brass casing is grounded. So... We also have a boron nitride insulator along the tungsten rod to prevent arcing where we don't want it to occur. And so we should get arcing right around here, whereas this is called the throat of the engine. And so we'll get arcing there at the throat. Nitrogen will get pushed through the throat, through the electrical arc. And then that'll be, like Austin said, the gas will be ionized. It'll have higher kinetic energy, higher velocity, and you'll get more thrust out of the nozzle here when the gas pushes against the nozzle and pushes the thruster forward. All right, so this is the previous arc jet design. Um, so, oh, you went, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, so this is our arc jet Mark III. So this was the previous design um, from last year. Um, so I'm gonna point out a couple things on it um, and then Ryder will go in to explain how we changed this design. So on the left here, you can see this is our nitrogen inlet section. So like Ryder mentioned, nitrogen is our propellant. So nitrogen is flowed in through here, and it goes through the system, and the next stop is the boron nitride insulator. So on the left here, this is the current, or the previous geometry that we had for this insulator piece. So as you can see, it's this large conical cut um, because this piece is a cylinder. And so as the gas flow comes in on this left side, um, it actually expands and diffuses into this piece and then converges back down to the throat. So there were a couple problems with this, um, but the primary one was actually how small the throat area was. Um, they were having a lot of difficulties with getting proper arcing across this system um, onto the brass nozzle piece. Um, and so we changed our design um, to help alleviate that concern. I um, mean, it was also preventing a lot of the nitrogen flow actually going through the system. So this final piece, the brass nozzle section, like I mentioned, is where the actual nozzle is. Um, so the nozzle looks very much like just an inverted um, designed for this, and so the gas actually expands out of it and then produces thrust out the back. So two primary concerns that we used in determining whether we wanted to redesign this or not is that we wanted a more streamlined design um, because there were several complications on the nitrogen inlet section um, on this piece um, that we were getting unwanted arcing across um, this part and the actual um, screws that used to mount it. Um, and then we also wanted to reconfigure the geometry um, of the boron nitride insulator to improve thermal efficiency um, and to alleviate those arcing complications. So now I'll kind of talk about our design, which we, Austin and I, designed, and then we had produced by the machine shop here on campus. And so again, starting at the left here, oh man, this controller is just too much for me. So again, here's the nitrogen inlet section, and you can see it's much more, s it's much simpler than the previous design. So we like that because the nitrogen has to travel less distance, it'll lose less velocity and less kinetic energy. Um, and so we'll have more energy when we want to expel it and get the thrust that we want. 
Uh, next up, we have the boron nitride insulator, which again, the geometry is here on the left, and you can see that the uh, section is the same diameter for quite a while until we finally compress it down into the throat section. And again, that diameter matches up with the nitrogen inlet section so that the gas doesn't have to expand and diffuse and lose energy to the uh, environment. Again, more thrust, higher energies, etc. Uh, finally, the boron nitride insulator, as Austin was talking about, has a larger throat area. Uh, and that facilitates better arcing in that area uh, and allows more nitrogen gas to get through. We also redesigned the brass nozzle section. Really the only parameter we changed here was the expansion ratio, which is essentially just the ratio of the exit area to the throat area in here. Um, we will see if that's optimized once we actually have our thrust stand and we can take quantitative measurements of the um, arc jet while it's being fired. Uh, but we hope that that did help with the nitrogen flow. So um, our, we just recently, in the past two weeks, um, started arc jet testing. And so because we don't currently have a thrust stand to take thrust measurements, our testing has been primarily um, qualitatively based. So we've wanted to adjust various parameters to ensure that we get stable and sufficient arcing across the throat area, um, as well as adjusting the nitrogen flow um, and so we can get proper plumes out the back um, that will hopefully produce um, solid levels of thrust. So kind of the big three main things that we've varied, um, we varied the wattages supplied into the system. Um, we also tested both with and without the nitrogen or the boron nitride insulator piece, um, which you'll see on the next slide um, without it. And then finally, we also adjusted component positioning within the system. Um, so that was primarily just our tungsten rod cathode um, and varying the position in relation to that throat area um, to see how far back we can get stable arcing with allowing maximum levels of nitrogen flow through that throat. Okay, so on this side, we actually have some pictures of testing that we did uh, these past couple of weeks here in the Space Systems Lab. So both of these pictures were taken under the same exact operating um, conditions. And so that was 600 volts uh, across the tungsten rod to the brass, um, around two to three tor of pressure, which one atmosphere is around 760, up here we're around 640. Um, and then, but the one difference that we had was on the left side, we have a nitrogen flow rate of around nine grams per minute. And on the right side, we have a nitrogen flow rate of around five grams per minute. And so as you can see, the one on the right is much more streamlined. And so that makes us think that most of these particles are being shot out directly to the left, or sorry, the right, which means that you'd get a force vector onto the engine directly to the left. Um, on the left side here, there's much more gas being pushed through. It's kind of diffusing and being pushed in all these directions. So even though we have more mass flowing through the system, we might not get as much thrust as we would with the right. But again, we need to have our thrust stand in order to uh, quantitatively and definitively say whether or not um, we get more thrust with a lower flow rate or vice versa. Um, and also both these pictures and these were, um, were taken while the thruster did not have the boron nitride inside. So this is sans boron nitride. So you've heard us mention several times already um, about our thrust stand. Um, so this was actually primarily designed by the previous um, capstone last year. Um, however, we did make several design choices and changes to it, um, as well as just some uh, errors in um, sizing and things like that. Um, so I'll kind of just briefly explain how this thrust stand works. Um, so you mount the thruster on the top here um, on these two mounts here, and it is actually an inverse pendulum design. So as the thruster thrusts on the top, this part will lean back into a measuring device here, um, and then it'll output a thrust measurement. Um, so it is highly sensitive, as indicated by the name, um, and so we're hoping that we can actually get some really accurate measurements from these low power um, thrusters that we'll be testing. Okay, so we've kind of been discussing what we've been doing and what the past has been doing, but now we'd like this project to 
continue on on campus as it's been here for multiple years. And so right now we're kind of continuing work on optimizing the arc jet thruster. And then definitely once we get that thrust stand built, that's our next goal to be able to quantitative quantitatively measure um, our thrust outputs. So long-term goals um, past just this next year or two um, are to kind of branch out, experience more types of thrusters and propulsion. Um, so very specifically, Dr. White here on campus actually has a Hall Effect thruster and that we hope to do a collaboration with him and his undergraduate research project. Um, we also want to do a future collaboration with EagleSat and actually implement one of our thrusters onto their CubeSat satellites. Um, that is probably a pretty long-term goal, um, but we do hope that the project will continue for many years to come. So I know questions will be left for the end, um, but we also have our emails up here in case you have any longer questions that you think of after the presentation. So okay. thank you so much and thank you. have a good day. All right, we'll take a quick break once again uh, as we let the next person set up for their presentation. Please do stay tuned. Thank you all for uh, continuing to join us today for these exciting presentations. Our uh, next student today is Alexander Barrett. He has been working with Dr. Jones and will be talking about second order globber correlations for gravitational waves. Um, Alexander will be continuing on for a master's degree at the University of Edinburgh this fall. So we look forward to hearing more from his research in the future. All right, thank you. Uh, as Dr. Richardson said, uh, I'm Alexander, and I'm going to be giving a talk about the second-order Glauber correlation of gravitational waves. Uh, my work has actually already been published in the Proceedings of the First Electronic Conference on Universe, so this presentation will just be a very brief overview uh, of that. So I'd first like to introduce uh, interferometers, if you aren't already familiar. So up on the screen are two double-slit interferometers, which are some of the simplest types. Um, and the main concept behind interferometers that we need to take away is that they make waves interfere either constructively or destructively with each other. Uh, and this construction or destruction creates what's called an interference pattern. And we can then look at this interference pattern and extract data about the original wave. So the, our research uh, concerned a more complicated type of interferometer called, an uh, called a Hanbury brown twist or HBT interferometer. Uh, this interferometer is kind of unique in that it's an intensity interferometer as opposed to an amplitude interferometer, and it uses two detectors instead of one. Uh, as we're interested in gravitational waves, we'll be using the two detectors that LIGO has used uh, to detect gravitational waves as the two detectors for our HBT interferometer. So to actually get something useful from the HBT interferometer, we have to use something called the second order Glauber correlation function and that's the function g2 of tau shown on the screen. Uh, and this function g2 of tau is a function of the intensity at detector one and the intensity at detector two. Uh, the intensity at detector one is i of t and the intensity at detector two is i of t plus tau. Uh, and tau denotes the time difference between detections. So on the right we have some example um, correlations from, the, uh, from an electromagnetic wave. Uh, and the reason why we want to do this with uh, gravitational waves is that this correlation, we can compare it to uh, correlations of electromagnetic waves and find things out about the gravitational waves like its degree of coherence among some other properties. So traditionally when calculating the uh, second order Glauber correlation function you have to use a time-weighted average. Uh, unfortunately that does not work for 
our case, as the gravitational waves we're looking at are very short-lived, and they pass through the detectors very briefly. So when you take the correlation of those types of waves, um, you get some kind of nonsense answers that I'll show you later. Uh, so we had to use an intensity weighting, which you can look on the screen is just explicitly spelling out um, how we actually weighted it. The weighting term is the I of T plus zero, and the, um, and the resulting correlation is shown on the bottom, uh, and this is with an oscillatory intensity. Uh, and the reason why we chose intensity as opposed to, say, the amplitude is that the intensity is always positive. So now if we actually compare the two correlation functions, on the left we have the standard way of calculating the um, correlation function with the time average. Uh, and both, I should say, both of the intensities uh, are the same. So the same thing was plugged into both of these correlation functions. Uh, as you can see, the only really main difference is the amplitude and the steepness. But other than that, they do have the same characteristics. Uh, so that was enough justification for us to move on and actually use it with gravitational waves. So we now need to create a very simplified model of a gravitational waves using something called a sine Gaussian. Uh, and that's the function on the right, or the graph on the right. And we tried as best we could by eye to fit it with a very small section of the plot on the left, the very middle plot. Uh, and if you don't recognize that plot, that is the discovery signal detected by LIGO of the first gravitational wave. So now that we have this approximation of a gravitational wave, we can plug it into the correlation functions. So first, with a standard time-weighted average, uh, you actually end up getting an amplitude that's completely dependent on the time period you're waiting over. So it doesn't actually tell you any, um, anything useful about the physical characteristics of the wave. And on top of that, as the time between detections tau goes to infinity, the correlation goes to infinity, which is to say as the time between detections goes to infinity, they're infinitely correlated. So there isn't a wave at either detected, but they're still ha somehow correlated. Doesn't really make sense. Luckily, with our intensity weighting, uh, we can get a simple closed form solution, which is equation five, which is graphed on figure 10, uh, and it has a good characteristics. Um, as the time difference goes to infinity, the correlation goes to zero, as you might expect. Uh, and the last thing that I've done is uh, create a simplified model of gravitational wave. On the left, we again tried to match it with um, the signal detected by LIGO. And on the right is actually the same function, but without the oscillating portion. Uh, and the reason uh, I've included that is that the extraction of the amplitude from the actual signal is an important part of calculating the second order global correlation function. Unfortunately, don't really have time to get into that. Um, but I've included it just to make sure I <laughs> remember to say it. Uh, and then lastly, we have the equation on the bottom, which is just a complicated way of saying this gravitational wave uh, is made up of three parts um, from a black hole merger, which is or an in-spiral merger, and uh, ring down phases of a black hole merger. Uh, and that concludes everything that I've done. All right, and once again, we'll take a quick break as we transition to the next speaker. All right, and our last speaker for today to celebrate our capstone students graduating this spring semester of 2021 is Nate Treadway. Uh, Nate will be talking about analysis of the fourth gamma ray pho photo peak near the CCM detector. Uh, Nate has uh, hopes to find a new job uh, as he graduates this spring, and he's especially hopeful to find something with nuclear physics or optics in the near future. So if you're hiring and watching this today, Nate is your person. So uh, with that, without further ado, take it away. Thank you very much, Dr. Richardson. 
Hi everybody, good afternoon. I'm Nate Treadway, and today I'll be presenting on the analysis of the fourth gamma ray photo peak near the CCM detector. So a quick overview of what I'm going to be covering is the purpose of this whole experiment, the setup, the calibration of the detector that was used, the data collection, and finally the results and analysis. So at Los Alamos National Labs in New Mexico, the CCM or coherent Captain Mills detector is a detector that's being used to isolate the signal from sterile neutrinos. Um, a sterile neutrino is a particle that has not been officially um, proven to exist yet. And the CCM is unable to detect the signal if there's too many gamma rays near the detector. So the germanium detector was placed next to the CCM in order to detect gamma rays around the CCM. The Lujan source is the source of the neutrino beam that will be shot at the CCM. The embry-riddle wall and the 5 meters of steel around the CCM were placed there to reduce interference from other isotopes within the lab. So throughout this presentation, I will be, refer I will, I will be referencing two different types of data. Data that was taken by the ger germanium detector while the neutrino beam was on and while the neutrino beam was off. The data that was collected while the neutrino beam was on will be called beam on data and the other one will be called beam off data. So when the germanium detector collected data from the isotopes around the CCM, it detected 19 different photo peaks. Now whether the neutrino beam is on or off, these 19 photo peaks should be the same since they're collecting data from the 19 isotopes in around the detector. However, this was not the case. So the, to calibrate the germanium detector, a cesium and a cobalt source were placed directly near it and their photo peaks were measured. Because we already knew the energies of these photo peaks, we were able to derive this equation relating the channel number and the energy that the photo peak occurred at, where the channel number is mu and the energy of the photo peak is E. We then removed those cesium and cobalt sources and took data of the isotopes that were in and around the detector. As we can see, there are 19 different peaks with the beam on and beam off data. The beam on data was collected four times as long as the beam off data and therefore has four times as many counts underneath it. Peak four on this data, as we can see even now, has a higher peak for beam on than beam off did, which is unusual because if they're detecting the same isotopes, they should have the same amount of counts underneath the curves. I then corrected for the time difference by um, multiplying the beam off data by the um, difference in time that the two um, data sets were taken. And we can see even clearer now that the beam off data does indeed have a much higher count than the beam off data. So this is what warranted a further investigation of the peak four, of the fourth photo peak. I then isolated the fourth photo peak from the rest of the 19 and did a chi-squared minimization analysis in order to determine um, different variables that came with the analysis. So I did a, um, a Gaussian fit, and of the variables that I identified, I got the channel number that corresponded to the peak of the, um, to the height of the peak. Using the equation that I presented earlier, I was able to convert that into the energy that the, peak of fo um, the photo peak occurred at. The energy of the beam on peak was 513.759 kilo electron volts, and the energy of the beam off peak was 513.555 kilo electron volts. A difference of 0.2 kilo electron volts may not seem like a lot, but it's actually a difference of one standard deviation. Now, like I said earlier, if these two peaks were picking up the same isotope, then the energy should be the same and not have a difference of one standard deviation. So it's possible that they are indeed picking up different isotopes. To confirm our suspicions, I then corrected for the time difference in the just the peak four analysis and plotted it in the logarithmic plot to see the difference in the counts underneath the curves. Even after the time was corrected, the beam on curve has four times as many counts under underneath it than the beam off. So it's picking up a lot more gamma rays than the beam off um, data is. This confirmed our suspicion that the beam on and beam off data were indeed picking up different isotopes. I then, since I now knew that I was looking for two different isotopes and I knew what the energies of these isotopes were, I started looking at nuclear data tables. 
I search for an energy range close to what um, I had found earlier. And to narrow down which isotopes I was looking at, I also included the isotopes that had a spin angular momentum of um, a low spin angular momentum. So the reason I was looking for isotopes with a low spin angular momentum is because those isotopes are more likely to naturally occur. These are the four isotopes that were most likely to be causing that um, large peak for beam on, and gadolinium 153m is highlighted because of those four, it is the most likely to cause this discrepancy. What ended up happening is the neutrino beam, when it's turned on, excites a nearby source of gadolinium into the 153m state. Then after 3.5 microseconds, this isotope of gadolinium then decays, and as it decays, it lets out a gamma ray, which is then picked up by the germanium detector. Because there's so many of these decays happening at once, the germanium detector picked up a lot of these counts, resulted in the resulting in an extremely large peak. For the beam off isotopes, gadolinium was once again the most likely isotope to be causing this, and this is because it has a stable lifetime, which means that it would be in both the beam on and beam off data, but we couldn't see it in the beam on data because it was overshadowed by all of the gadolinium 153M decaying. Gadolinium is also in and around th um, the lab at, Nos at Los Alamos. So it, there's an extremely high likability, there's ex extremely high um, chance that there's gadolinium in and around where um, this testing is taking place. Therefore, in conclusion, gadolinium 153M is the cause of the discrepancy in the um, peak in the fourth photo peak. Are there any questions? All right. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today via our YouTube stream. And again, I would like to congratulate on behalf of all the faculty, all of our graduating seniors this year. You have done outstanding work and we are proud to see you go off and start your new adventures after you leave Embry-Riddle. Um, I have been looking a little bit at the chat and I haven't seen many questions come up. I think uh, Ashley answered Andre's already. Other than that, I think there was uh, just another comment about other types of propulsions that we may want to consider in the future for your project. Um, but other than that, I would just like to once again, unless Eric tells me that there is something coming in right now, um, <coughs> I would just like to once again congratulate all of our graduating seniors. You have our full support and we wish you the best of luck as you go off on your adventures after you graduate in a couple weeks here at Embry-Riddle. So thank you everyone for joining us and have a great day.